Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic View Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and all major podcast providers. So if you can't catch the show live, you can download it or simply use our free podcast player, which is available on our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to connect with us, please post a question on our wall on Facebook or send me a tweet at June Stoyer on Twitter. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by Austria's Finest Naturally, authentic pumpkin seeds and pumpkin seed oil from the Steiermark, available at OrganicUniverse.com. Listeners of The Organic View can receive $1 off their purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. Also, don't forget to check out our contest section on our website to submit your information for our free monthly giveaways. For more information, please visit our website at www.TheOrganicView.com forward slash contests. So Foxiflora is a systemic pesticide from the sulfamine family, which is used primarily on a number of major crops, including cotton, soybean, citrus, stone fruit, nuts, grapes, potatoes, vegetables, and strawberries. Without any prior notice to beekeepers, EPA announced back in June of 2012 that it would grant a Section 18 emergency permission to use an unregistered product for use on cotton in four southern states, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Louisiana. A year later, Dow AgriSciences received U.S. EPA registration for sulfoxiflora in May of 2013. According to a Dow AgroSciences press release about the registration, quote, sulfoxiflora has unique attributes compared with other sap-feeding insecticides, providing a significant new tool for growers for many years to come. Recently, it was announced that a federal appeals court rendered a decision that EPA had to vacate the registration. On today's show, Michelle Colby, the program director of the Pollinator Stewardship Council, will talk about this decision and how this could impact other chemicals granted registration by EPA. So I'd like to welcome to the show, Michelle Colby. Thank you for having me on. (laughs) It is always great to have you on the show, Michelle, and congratulations. This is such a huge victory. It is. Uh, we, the beekeeping groups came together, the national associations, and we all worked uh, together for this effort because we had grave concerns about the use of sufoxiflor across so many pollinator attractive crops. Michelle, I want to just ask a couple of technical questions. When was the suit filed? Uh, right. We filed a petition uh, in July of 2013 with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And then we had the argument, an oral argument was uh, presented April of 2015. So certainly all of these federal appeals court things, processes take a while. Uh, When it initially was filed, then you had briefs, then people got to appeal the briefs. Uh, Then maybe friends of court people could file their amicus briefs. But we filed our or made our oral argument in April of 2015 uh, Quite well done by Greg Laurie of Earth Justice. Uh, He gave a wonderful oral argument for us and really made the case for the beekeepers and expressed our concerns about the safety of pollinators around this uh, pesticide. Michelle, could you just take a moment and explain to our listeners why sulfoxiflor poses a threat to honeybees as well as other pollinators? Well, as you were listed in the crops that it can be used on, it is used on pollinator-attractive crops. And if you look at the pesticide label for um, sufoxiflor, it's in two different uh, brand names. And while the label says it is highly toxic to bees, it's highly toxic also to aquatic vertebrates and toxic to fish, as well as some birds and earthworms, um, it does not then put on the label the practices to protect pollinators, the bee hazard statement, which would have extended that to on most crops, it says do not apply this pesticide when the crop is in bloom and bees are actively foraging. So the label never had that protective statement on it. The product was approved beyond um, the conditional use to um, unconditional without really collecting the uh, enough data to prove it was going to be safe. So, Our concerns were always based on EPA's own guidelines 
for approving a pesticide. And even with them, EPA's own documents to approve it, they said they didn't have enough information, that the data was flawed. Uh, it only studied the effect upon bees for 14 days, and that was it. Well, that does not look at the entire organism of a hive, uh, because a hive is the entire organism, not just the bee that flies into the field. So EPA acknowledged in their own documentation they had flawed data. We presented that to the court. The court agreed, and the court vacated the registration, really based on EPA's own admission. I think it's quite interesting the amount of discussion that has taken place especially amongst beekeepers, environmentalists, as well as citizens that have been truly outraged over the initial decision to grant registration. And then you have the discussion, or should I say the retaliation, by industry and industry apologists who felt that these particular folks who were advocating against the foxiflora were basically acting irrationally. Now, in one particular article that I thought was quite interesting, this was published by the Western Producer back in May 31st of 2013. It's an article written by Robert Amison. And there's a particular comment that I would just like to read. It says as follows, quote, like most commonly used insecticides, Sulfoxiflora so can be acutely toxic when bees contact the spray itself, but toxicity of sulfoxiflora is greatly reduced when the spray has dried. However, and, and that was a quote from Mark Whalen, an entomologist with Michigan State University. And he made another very interesting comment. He said, quote, if a guy like me has to go back and review the toxicity data on sulfoxiflora, what's the likelihood that Sandy Miller, an everyday homemaker, is going to be able to understand this, said Whalen, who advises the EPA and the U.S. Department of Agriculture on insect issues. I thought that that was quite an interesting comment, for the most part saying that unless we have a Ph.D., to understand what the impact is that we're really overreacting. Do you have any comments about what his statement was? I do. And certainly, again, it goes back to the pesticide label, so that for the average person or the farmer or the pesticide applicator, they are supposed to have on the label mitigation strategies to help to protect beneficial insects or children or the applicator themselves or the farm worker. There are supposed to be these protections on the label defining how to use the product so that it will be safely used. Now, again, with the sulfoxifor label, it did not define how to protect pollinators when you use the product. Now, whether the acutely toxic pesticide to be has a seven-hour half-life or a 14-day half-life, dead is dead. You can uh, kill all the foragers the first day, or you can kill them across 14, but by 14 there are no bees left around at all. You have wiped out a hive. But you can wipe out a hive in one day with acutely toxic pesticides because when you kill the food-gathering force of a beehive, they're done. They will be done. So you can rationalize the toxicity, as I told one entomologist, Fine, you could you know you can hit somebody with a one pound hammer or a five pound hammer. Certainly one is heavier than the other, but the person is still dead. So when we rationalize this toxicity level, still dead is dead. Acute toxicity is acute toxicity. In regards to this decision, do you think that it will open the door regarding EPA's decision to grant registration for other chemicals such as clothianidin? Well, certainly I think it will uh, encourage EPA to look at its other data that may be flawed, that uh, a lot of the registrations that did not go through Tier 2 testing to get um, longitudinal studies on the impact to beneficial insects like honeybee, it should make them look at those things. Don't know if it will, but that is certainly 
this case, I think, opens up that door to point out that the EPA, as the judge in this, one of the judges in this case said, the, the EPA cannot rely on its well-founded belief and its experience-driven professional judgment. They have to have evidence. This was the weakness in their, in this case with Sufoxifor, EPA did not have the evidence to prove that it could be used without causing adverse harm to pollinators. So it should also encourage them to start looking at their other products that they possibly unconditionally registered when they did not have all of the data. Over the past couple of years, it just seems as though EPA has been pushing through registration for so many different chemicals without going through what is supposed to be their own procedures. So I don't know how long it's going to take for the registration for these chemicals to be reexamined, but I sincerely hope that that is the case. If they have certain protocols and procedures, what have you, in place, they should really follow the guidelines that they've created. It just seems ludicrous that they're not doing that. Correct, and, and that's what the court said, what, what the uh, panel of judges in the Ninth Circuit Court also said, that the EPA has its rule, it has its criteria for um, analyzing good data versus bad data, and it's simply in the Sufoxifor case, EPA put that in writing when they knew they didn't have good data, when they knew the studies that were submitted were not um, valid studies, were not uh, did not meet their criteria for approving it. So, again, I think this is in one sense wonderful precedent that the court has set that EPA needs to follow their own criteria, their own guidelines, and follow through with them, not use their experience-driven professional judgment because that's not based in evidence. I'm just curious, what did they define bad data as it you was, know, it was it was um, a number of so-called tier two level research. Uh, it was tunnel studies, uh, putting bees into uh, tunnels so they could have a kind of control completely the pollen that was connected collected, control the pesticide exposure, things like that. But bees need diverse food, so you can't keep them in those tunnels for very long because that stress alone will start to affect the experiment. So it limits that experiment to 14 days. They extrapolated far too much on that 14 days that they said just 14 days then would not affect the long-term uh, health of the, the honeybee colony. Well, you can't do it that way. You have to look at across the growing season. You have to look at more than 14 days because it takes bees, depending on the cast, anywhere from 16 to 21 days to develop. So they never looked at brood. And they also did not follow, a couple of these studies did not follow uh, specific good uh, lab practices or good study practices as EPA defines. Now, I know Dr. Susan Kegley has done quite a bit of research on sulfoxiflor. I know you do a lot of work with Dr. Kegley. Could you just share a little bit about some of her efforts? Well, certainly, you know, Dr. Kegley, I know, is doing a lot of research with commercial beekeepers and through our organization right now, tracking hives as they pollinate our crops to get that real-world exposure to pesticides upon bees. And that is, that is key. When we, even with the pesticide registration, the one active ingredient is studied and that impact on bees. It is, and that does not reflect the real world because bees do not experience one pesticide on one crop in a short amount of time. They experience tank mixes, which is a mix of maybe a fungicide, an herbicide, an insecticide, and maybe a fertilizer mixed all in one tank. So Dr. Kegley has been examining the real-world exposure of our bees, looking at the pollen that's collected, the uh, nectar that's collected, the wax uh, as well, because the wax holds on to all these pesticides. So that is the research that truly needs to be done is the real world impact upon our bees because our bees can be exposed to anywhere from a dozen to three dozen toxic pesticides during a growing season while they pollinate our food. And folks, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Kegley's research, please visit www.pesticideresearch.com and also check out the article that's available on theorganicview.com that talks in detail about her hive tracking project, which is just 
such an amazing research project to examine exactly what honeybees are up against. Michelle, do you know what happens now with the products that are currently on the market? Well, that is the biggest question uh, in all of this opinion that came out of the Ninth Circuit Court. So the court has vacated and remanded the Sufoxifor registration to EPA, which means they vacated, they have made inviolate uh, the um, registration of Sufoxifor. So 45 days from September 10th, which is the date of the opinion when it was made, it was published, 45 days from the date of the opinion, Sufoxifor will be illegal to use. Now, what happens to the products that are already um, on uh, barn shelves, uh, in an applicator's airplane wings, you know, it's going to, that, that is the big question. So EPA has to look at its rules, its procedures, and determine what will happen in the next 45 days. But in uh, day 45 from September 10th, sufoxiflora will be illegal to use because the registration will have been revoked and it is illegal to use a unregistered pesticide. And what's the reality? Well, reality <laughs> could very well be that maybe they issue another Section 18 emergency for some crops. The reality could be that it, the EPA does uh, maybe another unconditional registration uh, demanding that they get the Tier 2 studies done in a certain amount of time. There Is this for the purpose of the market? It, it just doesn't make sense. If a decision has been rendered that it'll be illegal to sell this stuff... Well, I don't even know if the people who have purchased the product, are they going to turn around and sue somebody because now they purchased a product that's illegal? So there are so many ifs out there. So EPA has to determine now they have gotten this court ruling. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, so they could also appeal, uh, the um, which would take it then to the Supreme Court. So we will know in less than 45 days. <laughs> so we will all learn what EPA wants to do in reference to the court hearing in less than Well, we will, we will have to revisit this whole subject in 45 days and see what progress, if any, EPA has made. And I don't mean to be cynical, but it's just that this whole thing is just preposterous. Yes. It's preposterous that they granted sulfoxiflor registration to begin with, especially since EPA didn't even follow EPA's own guidelines. It doesn't make any sense. Right. As you said, it'll be interesting to see exactly what action they take and how protective they are as, as far as it comes to their job, which is to protect the environment. It just seems as though it's the never-ending saga. Mm -hmm. Michelle, thank you so much for being on the show today. Could you just remind our listeners what the Pollinator Stewardship Council's website is and how people can get involved with your organization? Well, certainly. Thank you. The uh, Pollinator Stewardship Council can be found online at www.pollinatorstewardship.org. We are a nonprofit organization of beekeepers uh, working with beekeepers to address the um, impact of pesticides upon pollinators, managed honeybees as well as native pollinators. So uh, we are kind of narrowly focused on just the impact of pesticides upon pollinators and it's and we do want to keep in mind it's not just the impact of the actual chemicals directly upon pollinators. It's also those pesticides used to destroy the forage of pollinators. So pesticides play two rules or two, um, two, have two aspects within the, the four Ps that are harming bees. We have pest, pathogens, pesticides, and poor forage. And poor forage is also the result of too much pesticide use. So we do a lot of work with state and local groups, helping them with their local solutions. And uh, we do wonderful things like this. It took us a long time to get the Supoxifor case uh, heard and processed, and we were successful in the end, and we are just uh, quite thrilled that, that the process concluded in our lifetime, and we won for beekeepers. Well, thank you for all of your effort. I, I know that it's been a tremendous battle, but, you know, once again, I do believe that this will set a precedent at least for the need to review other chemicals that have been granted full registration. So thank you for everything that you're doing, Michelle. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk with uh, you and your listeners. You're very welcome. And folks, 
please check out the companion article, which will be available on the Organic View website. And, you know, to be continued, Michelle, what can I say? Uh, well done, and just keep up the good work. Well, thank you. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>